Hello, welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership podcast series. My name is Scott Miller and I am your host each week. Today, you might notice the set is a little bit different, similar in terms of size and uh, books, but a different location. We are broadcasting today's podcast from the MGM Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada, where I'm privileged to both be the keynote to the Young President's Organization, known as YPO's Annual Governance Conference here, for the book that I wrote, Master Mentors, from HarperCollins. That is really a culmination of 30 of my most interesting interviews from the first year of our podcast, where I featured 30 interviewees as master mentors. In fact, volume two is coming out shortly from HarperCollins in October with 30 new insights and 30 new mentors. And perhaps maybe today's guest might even be agreed to be featured in volume three or volume four. Speaking of which, today's guest is Jonah Berger, the renowned marketing professor from the Wharton School in Pennsylvania, author of numerous best-selling books, arguably one of the world's preeminent voices on how to get people's attention, how to motivate people, how to get ideas to catch on and stick and to get viral, so to speak. And his book that we're featuring today is Contagious, Why Things Catch On. Jonah Berger, welcome to On Leadership. Thanks so much for having me. Jonah, thanks for your time today. If you hear some background noise, it's because there are nearly a thousand young presidents literally milling around the conference center here. People that are captivated, of course, with your book as well. As sessions open and close, you might hear some background noise and the same to our viewers and listeners. Jonah, what I'd like to do before we get into the book is would you reorient all of our listeners around the world, now that this is a, the world's largest weekly leadership podcast, to your own academic journey and the fields of expertise that you bring to your teachings and your writings as well. All right, so a quick version is I did my PhD at the Stanford Graduate School of Business um, uh, in marketing. Um, and I study things like social influence, word of mouth, change, and why products, ideas, uh, and behaviors catch on. And so uh, I've had the opportunity to work with an amazing array of organizations, everything from big Fortune 500s like the Googles and Nikes and Apple the World to small startups. And really love understanding customers, uh, consumer behavior, why people do what they do, and how by understanding the answers to that why, we can deliver products, services, and experiences that, that meet needs and really deliver excitement. Jordan, let's start broadly with why do you, what are the mistakes people make when they're attempting to change someone else's mind? Perhaps they're in sales, business development, marketing, advertising. Perhaps they're a leader who's trying to get people to change their minds and behaviors. What are the mistakes that we typically fall into when we're trying to influence others and have them change their minds? You know, often when we're trying to change others' minds or behaviors, we, we resort to some version of what I'll call pushing, uh, whether it's adding more facts, more figures, more reasons, more information. We think we just push people a little harder in the direction we want them to go, they'll come around. But if you think about the last time someone tried to push you and what you did in that situation, you probably didn't just do what they wanted. You probably dug in your heels, resisted, and thought about all the reasons you didn't want to do. Uh, what, what they suggested. And so really change isn't about pushing people harder. It's about identifying the barriers or obstacles to change, the things that are getting in the way and, and mitigating them. So I think you wrote for some research that between 20 and 50 percent of word of mouth advertising marketing communication is in fact behind people's purchasing decisions. It seems uh, higher than I would have thought, given all we spend on social media and SEO and you know Google Analytics and now online advertising. But you actually argue in the book not to underestimate the power that is still very relevant of word of mouth marketing. You reference, of course, Malcolm Gladwell's work extensively, a guest on this program as well. Talk about how important it is for all leaders not to discount word of mouth. If you think about the last product you bought, uh, the last service you tried, the last thing you did, and where you heard about it from, it was often another person, right? Ads can be useful in raising awareness or providing information. We often don't trust them as much as we trust our peers, right? When someone we know tells us something, we're much more likely to believe what they have to say because it's much more unvarnished, right? They're not only saying, I love everything, they're saying, I love this and this was less good. Whereas companies tend to say, hey, my stuff is great. Mm, sure, well, your stuff might be great, but the fact that you said it's great doesn't necessarily provide a lot of, uh, a lot of information. And so word of mouth tends to be a lot more powerful than traditional advertising, particularly later in that, in that customer journey or, or funnel. Advertising can still be useful, 
if we're raising awareness, um, but if we're really trying to persuade people, we're really trying to get people to take action, we've got to get them to talk and, and share. And, and I don't think that's surprising, right? Even if you see the flight to social media, uh, where advertising budgets used to be spent uh, offline and now they're spent online or um, working with quote unquote digital influencers, a lot of that is trying to replicate what we often see happening naturally uh, in, in word of mouth. And so I think companies, smart companies are realizing, look, we've got to understand word of mouth and, and use it more effectively. In fact, as I was reading Contagious, Jonah, I found myself resonating to so many of your stories. I happen to own a townhome with my family downtown Salt Lake City. When we're there, I'll be out in my front, front yard, so to speak, at a, like a brownstone, clipping my bushes or washing the steps down. And it's remarkable how many times my neighbors and I talk about restaurants we liked or books we read or cars we bought. And you're, all that's offline, you're exactly right, at lunch with my colleagues. It's, I think, an important reminder to anybody who owns marketing, advertising, social media budgets, sales leaders, to recognize that, to your point and contagious, that those who discount, if you will, word of mouth marketing are likely going to woefully underestimate how things can become viral, so to speak. In fact, to that point, you actually talk about what, it's, what is the formula for becoming viral, right? G generally, those who want a viral video will never get one. Will you talk a little bit about what are the tenets and principles of something becoming viral? Yeah. And what, I, what I would say is interesting is, first of all, it's not random, it's not luck, and it's not chance. There's a science behind why things catch on. We've looked at thousands of pieces of online content, tens of thousands of brands, millions of purchases. Again and again, the same six steps come up. Uh, and so in Contagious, I put them in a framework called the STEPS framework, which stands for social currency, triggers, emotion, public, practical value, and, and stories. Each of those is a psychological driver of why we talk and, and why we share. But importantly, while those things explain why videos go viral, I'm actually going to argue that that's not our goal. So a lot of people hear about the book Contagious and say, oh yeah, it's all about viral videos. And sure, we've all been in a meeting where someone said, you know what we need? We need a viral video. Viral videos, though, are often a flash in the pan. They're often here today, gone tomorrow, right? What does the fox say? It was like really popular for a whole week or two, uh, five or six years ago, and then it kind of disappeared. We don't want to be here today and gone tomorrow. We want to create enduring value for the companies and brands we represent. And so I think a much better way to think about our goals is what I'll call each one reach one. Our goal is not to get 10 million views for a piece of content. Our goal is to get 10 to 20% new customers. And the best way to do that is get each one of our existing customers to tell just one more person about us. That's not as sexy and as exciting as a video that gets 10 million views, but it's equally, if not more important. And so the question is really, how can every touch point we have between our existing customers and potential customers, between our brand and our existing customers, how can those be opportunities for people to talk about us, right? How can we use our stores or our customer service or our products or our pricing as an opportunity to generate word of mouth? How can we make sure if someone gets off the phone with customer service that they're gonna tell two, three, or four of their friends? The more we can design those experiences and products and services to be word of mouth worthy, the more effective we're gonna be. So you're saying it's creepy that I'm still watching the Fox video weekly, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I have three young boys who love this video. Jonah, before yeah. we get into the six steps, would you kind of walk us through the insights of the Blendtec story? We've all kind of heard of this story colloquially, but you have some closer access to it. Reorient our listeners and viewers to what a Blendtec is and talk about some of the lessons that are maybe adaptable from that entrepreneur's business to each of our own businesses or side hustles or perhaps future businesses as well. Yeah. Is it okay if I tell a little story here? Love it. Take your okay. time. Yeah. So, so um, uh, many of us think uh, that only certain things get talked about and shared, right? That you've got to be an exciting product or service. Sure, Tesla gets talked about a lot or sure, a hidden bar gets talked a lot about. But, you know, my product, my service, not so much. And I can't tell you how many companies, organizations I work with that say some version uh, of that, right? Like we're not the type of thing that people would, would talk about. And that's why I love the Blendtec story. So Blendtec makes blenders, not the most exciting product category you can think of. Uh, but a few years ago, they made a piece of content uh, that got over, across the set of pieces of content, over 200 million views. And what were these pieces of content? They were blending things in their blender. So I'll give you one example. They take an iPhone, they drop it in the blender. 
now literally an iPhone, right? Think about the thing sitting in front of you, whether it's an iPhone or Google phone, imagine dropping that in the blender, putting the top on, hitting the button and seeing what happens, right? And this phone goes, gets caught up in the blender and slowly but surely gets chopped up into pieces. Eventually there's like one piece of metal, a whole bunch of dust and little shards of glass and bits, right? It's almost like fine powder that, that comes out, right? It's amazing to watch. Now, this video has over, I don't know, 15 million views. The set has over 200 million. They blend all sorts of things. Blender sales go up over 700%, right? Now, any of us would be happy with a 700% sales increase, but that's not the most remarkable thing about this. They did this with a $50 marketing budget. Still not the most remarkable thing about this. The most remarkable thing about this is they did this for one of the least exciting things we can think of, which is a blender, right? Because it's not that certain things are naturally remarkable and the rest are doomed to fail. We can make anything uh, talk worthy, share worthy, buzzable if we find that inner remarkability, if we show people rather than tell them, right? Too often as businesses, we think, well, our goal, we should just tell people, right? Um, uh, you know, tell them why our product is so good. Tell them why our service is amazing. They're not going to listen if we just tell them, right? That sounds like a traditional ad. Most of us are going to change the channel. We're definitely not going to tell anybody about it. But if you watch a video of a blender pairing up an iPhone, you're going to share it with someone else because it's pretty remarkable. But along the way, they're going to learn something. And this is really one of the key ideas uh, of the STEPS framework. Great stories are like Trojan horses. They carry ideas for the long, long for the ride. They're going to learn that, wow, this company makes a really powerful blender. Because if it wasn't powerful, it wouldn't have blended an iPhone. And so it carries that key value proposition or idea uh, along with it. And so that I think is a key insight that pervades a lot of word of mouth. It's not about being the most exciting product or service out there. It's about finding that inner remarkability, understanding the human motivations that drive sharing and use that to get people to talk about you. Jonah, let's actually then visit these six steps. Let's spend a couple of minutes on each of them. You went through them very uh, quickly earlier. The first is what you call social currency. Will you describe what that is and maybe break that down for the common entrepreneur or young president or marketer in a company who's looking to create just that, social currency? Yeah, is it all right if I tell a quick story? Love it. Okay, so uh, imagine you're in New York City. Uh, you're, you're hungry, your stomach is rumbling, you gotta get a bite to eat. We notice a big hot dog shaped sign out in front of a restaurant with the words eat me written on it in what look like mustard. You say, huh, I haven't had a hot dog in a while, check this place out. So you walk down a flight of stairs into a restaurant called Criff Dogs. Now, if you like hot dogs, you'd be in heaven. They have every hot dog you can imagine, um, 30 some odd hot dogs on the menu. But in the corner, once you're done with your hot dog is a phone booth. And if you walk in that phone booth, it's cramped in there, right? It's a phone booth after all. There's a little phone on the wall. It's a rotor dial phone. You stick your finger in the number three, go around in a circle, hold the phone up to your ear. It will ring and someone will pick up and they'll ask you whether you have a reservation. Now, the first time I heard this story, I said, reservation? I'm in a phone booth inside of a hot dog restaurant. What could I possibly have a reservation for? But if you're lucky and a friend of yours made a reservation or they happen to have space, the back of that phone booth will open and you'll be led into a secret bar called Please Don't Tell. Now, please don't tell us violated a number of traditional laws of marketing, no sign on the street, no sign inside the restaurant. They've done everything they can to make themselves difficult to find. And yet, every day they're full. 3 p.m. phone lines open up. By 3.30, all the seats are gone. People at redial again and again trying to get through. It's not lack of competition, right? You may not have been to New York recently, but there's more than one bar in New York City. So how did they cut through the clutter? How did they get so much attention for what they were doing? Well, they did something really interesting. They made themselves a secret. Let me tell you a little secret about secrets. Think about the last time someone told you something and they told you not to tell anybody else, right? What's the first thing you then did with that information? Oh, well, immediately went and told as many people as possible but said, but don't tell. <laughs> <laughs> but that's basically what people do, right? Or they don't tell many people. But don't they tell, tell anybody. <laughs> and they tell those people not to tell, right? This is an example of what I call social currency. Just like the clothes we wear, just like the car we drive, the things we talk about and the things we share affect how other people see us. And so one way to get people to talk about us, our products, our services, our brands, our organizations is to make them look good, right? Too often we think a lot about ourselves. How do we look? Uh, do we show the product in a great way in our ad? We think a lot less about how people are going to look when they talk about us because the better we make them look, those consumers or customers, the more likely they'll be to talk about us and, and bring our brand along. 
In fact, Joan, it might be from a different part of the book, but I found the Sonicare, the electric toothbrush story, to be fascinating because there were whole cottage businesses and industries that helped to segment and congeal like-minded people to go out and ambassador products for people. Talk a bit about that, if you will. Yeah, you know, I think that uh, it's a company called Buzz Agent, um, and uh, they do some very neat work. And I think there's certainly examples of, you know, giving away products or services to encourage people to talk uh, and share. But I think the most important thing is that just jumpstarts a process that's already happening, right? When, when we think of word of mouth, I think many brands say, oh, I want word of mouth. What am I going to do? Well, maybe what I should do is pay people to talk about me, right? Because if I pay people to refer others, they'll definitely do it. The problem with that is that most of us share word of mouth for free. We talk about products we love and services we hate and experiences we had, not because we got paid, right? But because we want to help someone else out because we want to look good to our peers, because we needed to fill in conversational space and this thing was top of mind. And so if we understand the psychology of sharing, we don't have to pay people to talk. We can take advantage of their natural tendencies to do so. Now, if we have a terrible product or service, word of mouth is not going to help us. But notice that's not a word of mouth problem. That's a product or service problem, right? I often work with the companies say, oh man, we're getting so much negative word of mouth. Word of mouth is terrible. It's not word of mouth that's terrible. If you're a hotel and 100 consumers a day complain about the beds. It's not the fact that word of mouth is the problem. It's the fact that you've got a bad product and need to fix the product, right? And so word of mouth won't solve your existing problems, but it will help amplify the news and information and attributes you have to offer. So to talk about the second step, triggers, which I think is where the Sonicare story was written in the book. What's the role that triggers play in influence? Yeah, so I think a good way to think about triggers is we not only talk about things that make us look good, we talk about things that we're thinking about. So why do we talk about so often about the weather or what we, where we went for lunch, like you said, or restaurants and you know, the people have been to, or now the pandemic is ending, going back to work, or all these things we talk about all the time. They're not necessarily the most interesting things that happen to us, but we talk about them. Why are we talking about them? Well, often we're talking about them because they're top of mind, because we're thinking about them. Right? There was a, a very nice uh, study that was done a few years ago in the grocery store where they changed the music that played over the PA system. So some days they played French music, some days they played German music. What did they find? Well, on days they played French music, sales of French wine went up. On days they played German music, sales of German wine uh, and beer went, went up. Did the music change what wine people liked? No, they like whatever they like. All it did was remind them to think about it because it reminded them to think about it, they were more likely to purchase it because 70% of purchase is consideration. Are you thinking about something or not? And the same thing is true of word of mouth. We talk about a lot of things, not just because they're interesting, but because we're thinking about them, right? And so the key insight there is, well, how can we make sure to link ourselves to things in the environment so that people think about us when they see those things? If I said peanut butter and, for example, you might say peanut butter and jelly. Sandwich? Jelly. Or if I said rum and, you might think of the word Coke. Even though peanut butter is there, but jelly isn't, peanut butter makes you think of jelly because they're connected, right? One is a trigger or reminder for, for the other. And so I think, again, the key there is to think of, well, how can I link my product or service to stuff in the environment so that when they see this problem, when they have this issue, when they uh, have this desire, they think about me and are more likely to talk about me and, and purchase me as well. Jonah, I think my favorite of the six uh, steps, if you will, was the third emotion. I served as the chief marketing officer for a decade of the Franklin Covey Company. And we've had many guests on this program like Donald Miller and Nancy Duarte, Seth Godin, that, of course, have great insights and influence on messaging and that often companies fall into the trap of writing about themselves, their own journey, their own story. They don't write in ways where other people have an emotional connection to it. I thought the third emotion step where you talked about the fascinating uh, sort of uh, research study you did on the Wall Street Journal and New York Times. Will you talk about what you learned from looking at some of the most viral shared stories on those newspapers and what do they have in common? Yeah. So we did this project a few years ago where we're interested in, in what makes online content viral. Uh, and this project actually started in God, I think around 2006. Uh, this is before sort of online was the way it is today. And 
you know, the, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal would have little pieces of paper in their main newspaper on page A2 or something would say, this is the most read articles or most shared articles of the, of the past day. And I used to sort of clip these out and sort of try to find patterns, like what makes certain articles more likely to be shared? Uh, I ended up that that was a very slow and laborious way to do it. And um, a collaborator of mine had a wonderful idea. She said, well, why don't we just scrape all the content from one of these newspapers, look at what goes viral, look at the content and try to understand why. And so we did exactly that. We took six months of articles from the New York Times, everything from front page news to you know back of the sports section, everything from uh, style information and science and everything you can imagine, uh, over 7,000 articles. Uh, and we looked at what goes viral and why. Uh, what about the, the articles themselves uh, made it go viral? And in addition to whether the person who wrote them was famous and whether it got it featured on the homepage, one key thing we found was emotion. Right? The more an article made people care, the more they ended up sharing. But what's interesting is that not all emotions had the same effect. Right? We tend to think about emotions as positive and negative. And you might say, well, we share positive things, maybe because they make us look good, but we don't share negative things because they don't make us look very good. And indeed, we found something consistent with that. People share positive things more than the negative ones. But when we dug a little deeper, we found something quite fascinating. Whereas if you looked at articles that made people sad, people were less likely to share them. The more an article made someone sad, the less likely they were to share it. Consistent with negative emotion, not increasing sharing. But if you looked at anger and anxiety, both of those are also negative emotions. Neither of those make people feel good. Yet articles that made people angry or anxious were more likely to be shared, not less. And so both sadness and anger, for example, are negative emotions, yet they're having diametrically different effects on sharing. Why? And so we ended up digging deeper, looking at positive emotions as well. And what we found is it's not about positiveness or negativeness. It's about physiological arousal or activation. Some emotions, they fire us up. When we feel them, we wanna take an action. Think about what you wanna do when you're angry, for example. You wanna yell, you wanna throw something, you wanna do something. When you're sad, you sort of wanna curl up in a ball and, and do nothing. And so we find that arousal or activation associated with those different emotions drive sharing. Whether positive or negative emotions that fire us up, the negative side, anger and anxiety, but the positive side, inspiration, excitement, surprise, all drive sharing. Whereas emotions that power us down, whether sadness on the negative side or contentment on the positive side, yeah. lead to less sharing. And so it's not just about making people feel good. Right? Too often as, as marketers and organizations, we think, oh, if people just like us, they'll be willing to share. It's not whether they like us or not. It's whether they're fired up enough to take action. Um, and those high arousal emotions really help. And in fact, Jonah, the most shared articles were a very disparate subjects, weren't they? It was fascinating to see some of the wide range of topics that actually got shared. Uh, yeah, science articles actually did surprisingly well um, uh, because they tend to evoke inspiration. Not all science articles get shared, but um, the really great ones really evoke this sense of the wonderment of the world. Um, and, and awe is often a high arousal emotion, and, and that in turn increases sharing. Did you find from your research anything in particular that marketers and advertisers might take note of that generally these types of articles, although perhaps worthy in their reporting, generally just kind of fell flat? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the interesting thing. It's not just about the content itself. It's not just about whether the topic is good or bad. I think sometimes, particularly in the media, we have a sense of, oh, people will share this and they won't share that. A lot of it's how it's written, right? Does it evoke those emotions? Does it um, have practical value? Does it make people look good when they share it? It's not just about the content, um, but about the way the content is written that can really have, have impact. Jonah, most of us live our lives, obviously, in social right now, although you would, you, would, you would discount how influential social media is actually in triggering purchasing decisions and as opposed to word of mouth, are there any core principles or tenets right now? If you were speaking to a chief marketing officer or chief revenue officer, they're putting together their social media plan, their ad budget, because that is a part of everybody's business to some extent. Anything that you would have us remember this really to say, think of this, don't do that. Be reminded of this. Don't do that. You can't will something viral, but there have to be some tenants. Yeah, I think um, uh, when it comes to budgets, first of all, don't just think about online, think about offline. It's yeah. not that online isn't valuable. Social media is a way to generate word of mouth and can be a useful way to generate word of mouth. But most word of mouth is offline. Most word of mouth uh, is face to face. And by focusing solely online, we tend to focus a lot on the technology rather than the psychology. It's not enough just to be on a platform. It's not enough to have a lot of friends and followers. We have to get people to share our stuff, right? Most people online are, 
are talking, they're not listening. Uh, rarely do things online have the impact that, that we hope, not never, but, but rarely. And so we need to make sure that we're meeting people where they are and we're encouraging the conversations that are, that are going to have uh, impact. And so I would say that. And then the second thing I would say is really just start with understanding. Right? Start by understanding your customers, your existing customers, your potential customers, where they are, who they talk to, where they look for information, and how you can make sure your information, your brand, product, and service crosses that transom, right? Crosses from an existing customer to a potential one, whether they're at a movie, whether they're having dinner, whatever they're doing, what's going to make that person talk about you rather than something else? And how can you use it to grow your organization? Because the nice thing about word of mouth is it's free. Right? Advertising, we have to pay per impression or pay for click through. We don't have to pay for word of mouth. Every time someone talks about us, it's free. All we have to do is figure out how to get them to talk and, and share. Of course, that requires us uh, as business owners and leaders to actually ask and listen to our clients, right? What is it you're looking for? Who do you talk to? What do you need? It requires yeah. that, that insight. Um, yeah. Let's talk about the fourth step, which you just simply name public. Yeah, and sorry, Scott, I probably have time for one more question. So should we do this one or something else? Well, you tell me, which are the final three? Public, practical value, or stories? Which of those final three most uh, you think will resonate? Oh, man, uh, all of them are good. I think that the quick thing, I will, I'll give you a quick answer to practical value, and then we can wrap up. What was neat about writing this book um, is uh, I wrote it before the wave of content marketing. Um, and so today, you know, what you see marketers doing, which is really smart, is rather than talking about how great they are, Instead, they're giving away valuable, useful, entertaining content uh, and using that to grab and hold attention. And that's really what practical value is all about. News you can use, right? Useful information that makes others better off. We not only share things because it makes us look good, uh, we share things because it helps others uh, out and makes their lives easier and better. And that's really what practical value is all about. Jordan, what's next for you? Uh, you know, everything I'm doing at the moment, most of the research is around natural language processing extracting behavioral insight from textual data. So what are the words we use that are more persuasive on sales calls? What is the language customer service agents use that lead to greater customer satisfaction? How can we write things that will be more engaging or make presentations more engaging? So all about the power of magic words and how we can extract insight from, from language data. Sounds fascinating. We'll look forward to having you perhaps back on the podcast to talk about that. Jonah Berger, Wharton Business School professor and author of numerous books, including Contagious. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks to you all. We'll see you back here next week for another topic where we broadcast live from Las Vegas at the MGM Hotel during the Young President's Organization Annual Governance Meeting. Thanks so much.